Today's liturgy may be said to echo the celebration of the fourth Sunday of Easter, which we celebrate every year of the three-year Sunday cycle of readings, A, B, and C, which is commonly referred to as Good Shepherd Sunday. Since all the Bible readings for that liturgy every year during the Easter season, including the responsorial psalm and Alleluia verse, accent a very pastoral theme. And so we could say the same about today, during ordinary time, the theme of the Good Shepherd. But whereas the liturgy of the fourth Sunday of Easter every year accents the Good Shepherd theme in a positive sense, today's liturgy for the 16th Sunday in ordinary time, year B, accents the Good Shepherd theme in somewhat of a negative sense insofar as good shepherding is lacking. Now, the overall theme of good shepherds and good shepherding must be an important one in the mind of Holy Mother Church, the Bride of Christ, because she gives it to us every year on a Sunday, both within the Easter season and outside the Easter season. For example, in today's first reading from the prophet Jeremiah, we read, Woe to the shepherds who mislead and scatter the flock of my pasture, says the Lord. You have scattered my sheep and driven them away. You have not cared for them. Strong words from the prophet Jeremiah. And in today's gospel, we read that Jesus' heart was moved with pity for them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Again, good shepherding lacking, huh? And today's responsorial psalm echoes the truth that the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Which means conversely that you will be left wanting if the Lord is not your shepherd. Either on his part toward you or on your part toward him, you will then be wanting if the Lord is not your shepherd. Now, it's no secret that the human person has a compelling and even intellectual need to be shepherded, if for nothing else, because of the original sin, right? We're so weak and wounded. The darkening of the intellect and the weakening of the will, the two chief effects of the original sin, the fall of our first parents, We need to be shepherded. And as Christians, it is specifically Christ who is our chief pastor and shepherd, the church teaches, guiding us even today through his bride, the church. From his ascension Thursday, 40 days after his resurrection, until he comes again on the day of judgment, his bride acts in his stead. Led by the successor of Peter and the bishops in communion with him, the apostolic college. Vatican II teaches us in Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church, chapter 6, quote, the church is a sheepfold. Beautiful wording. The church is a sheepfold, the sole and necessary gateway, that is the door, to which is Christ. Today's communion antiphon will make reference to the door, the gateway to which we are led in fully to Christ, our chief pastor and shepherd. Lumen Gentium continues, the church is also a flock of which God foretold that he himself would be the shepherd and whose sheep, although watched over by human shepherds, are nevertheless at all times led and brought to pasture by Christ himself, the good shepherd and prince of shepherds who gave his life for his sheep. No greater love is there than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. He is our Prince of Shepherds. Interesting, too, is the fact that the human person is social by nature, and sheep are also very gregarious by nature. They like to be amongst other sheep. And both humans and sheep need to be guided and led, right? 
So if we stop and think just for a moment about the importance of being shepherded, of, of being guided, if you will, of, of being led, or just in general of good leadership, right? We can come up with some of these examples. Companies need a CEO. Schools need a principal. Colleges need a president. A board of directors needs a president of the board. Boards of regents need a chancellor. Countries need a president or a prime minister. Sports teams need a coach or a team captain, or both. 4-H and FFA need project leaders. Children need parents. Families need a father who acts as the true head, that is, the priest, the Christ figure of the home. Platoons need a lieutenant. An airplane needs a pilot. Trains need a conductor. The Supreme Court needs a chief justice. Monasteries need an abbot or abbess or a prior or a prioress. Active religious orders need a father general, a mother general, or a superior general. Parishes need a pastor. Dioceses need a bishop. And the Universal Church, Holy Mother Church, the Bride of Christ, needs a Pope. Good leadership, being led, being guided, it's important. Now, unfortunately, the flock, that is the church, which again Vatican II calls a sheepfold, can be harmed in subtle, hidden ways and even in blatant ways, if not led properly. The history of the church shows that its enemies have used both methods often. Number one, sometimes the enemy enters the flock in a secretive way to harm it from within. Sometimes the enemy or enemies attack the church from the outside openly and violently. Think of the French Revolution from which the Fathers of Mercy was born out of as a community. Now, one way to avert these two ways of attack on the sheepfold or the flock of the church is through good, solid, and faithful preaching and catechesis. Pope St. John Paul II, during a 1995 visit with a group of American bishops during their ad lumina visit to Rome, said, quote, one of the greatest obstacles to the faith in the West is superficial preaching, end quote. Pope St. John Paul II. The story is also told that during that same ad lumina visit with that same group of American bishops, John Paul II was a little fashionably late. And when he entered the Grand Hall in the Vatican where all the bishops of this particular group were seated already, he had to walk quite a bit across the floor of the Grand Hall to get to the chair where he would be seated while he addressed the group of bishops. So after arriving a little bit late, as he entered the door and walked across the hall to the chair, he said this four times. Coraggio. 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 Courage in Italian. What a loving chief shepherd he was to want to guide his sons to be courageous shepherds themselves. That's a beautiful story. If you stop and think about it and dissect it, it's a beautiful story. He was a father. We are so blessed with the office of the chair of Peter. We are so blessed with a pope And this in a day and age when the culture of death is seemingly gaining an upper hand, right, within the culture. And when religious freedoms are clearly under attack and challenge by the modern day society. Why is this important? Because bad philosophies like those that promote relativism and secular humanism promote an anything goes mentality. And that's very, very dangerous. 
to the point of the possible loss of the salvation of souls. Very, very dangerous. So here's my thesis today, and please, please remember this. Please, please take this home with you, intellectually and in practice. We need to pray for our bishops. We need to pray for our Pope, who is the Bishop of Rome. We need to fast for our bishops, really, truly, and sincerely so. We need to include them in our spiritual practices with deliberate intention when we carry out this or that particular spiritual practice. Make a deliberate act of the will, a deliberately willed intention to include the bishops in that spiritual practice. Offer holy communions for those who lead us in the church. Fast for them, pray for them. The daily rosary, the daily divine mercy chaplet. They are really, truly successors of the apostles chosen by our Lord. Do you believe this? They are really, truly successors of the apostles chosen by our Lord. Do you believe this? Do you truly believe this? Do you truly believe in the apostolic succession of the Catholic bishops right down to this modern day and age in which we live? I do. I praise the Blessed Trinity for the structure of the church. So I'd like to propose that when we pray and fast for our bishops with deliberate intent, we pray and fast especially for them to imbue the virtues of supernatural courage and supernatural fortitude. It's been said that, and I love these, it's been said that courage may be defined as God's grace under pressure. <laughs> Don't you love it? <laughs> it's been said that courage may be defined as God's grace under pressure. It's also been said that courage is fear that has said its prayers. Aristotle states, you will never do anything in this world without courage. It is the greatest quality of the mind next to honor. You will never do anything in this world without courage. It is the greatest quality of the mind next to honor. And C.S. Lewis in his screw tape letters writes, quote, Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the very form of every virtue at its testing point, which means at the point of highest reality, end quote. Again, C.S. Lewis, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the very form of every virtue at its testing point, which means at the point of highest reality. Speaking of reality and the culture, St. John Paul II in 1976, still as Cardinal Carol Wojtyla, two years before he was elected Pope in 1978, gave his farewell address to the Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia, the birth city of our great nation, and said these words, words both prophetic and startling at the same time. Quote, we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think the wide circle of the American society or the wide circle of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. This confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It is therefore in God's plan, and it must be a trial which the church must take up and face courageously. We must prepare ourselves to suffer great trials before long, such as will demand of us a disposition to give up even life and a total dedication to Christ and for Christ. With your and my prayers, it is possible to mitigate the coming tribulation, but it is no longer possible to avert it. 
because only thus can the church be effectually renewed. How many times has the renewal of the church sprung from the shedding of blood? This time, too, it will be the same. We must be strong and prepared and trust in Christ and in his Holy Mother and be very, very assiduous in praying the Holy Rosary. John Paul II, now saint, in 1976, two years before he was elected Pope, in Philadelphia, still as Cardinal Karo Oitiwa, at the closing of the Eucharistic Congress there. How does the church define supernatural courage? Supernatural courage is the virtue of bravery in facing difficulties, especially in overcoming the fear of consequences in doing the good. It enables a person to pursue a course deemed right and fitting at the moment, through which one may incur contempt, disapproval, criticism, or condemnation from others. It differs from fortitude in being more aggressive in undertaking, whereas fortitude is more patient in undergoing what is still virtuous, but also difficult or hard. The moral virtue of supernatural courage is divinely infused into the soul along with sanctifying grace. As a supernatural virtue, it is needed to practice what Christ commanded or recommended his followers to do. What he commanded them to do are called his precepts, and what he recommended they do are called his counsels. Supernatural courage. How about supernatural fortitude? Again, the two things we want to pray for our bishops about and our Holy Father about in this modern day and age. Amidst a culture of death and when religious freedoms are being challenged. The gift of supernatural fortitude, one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, Fortitude gives a person a special strength of will. This gift confers an extraordinary readiness to undergo trials patiently for love of God or in fulfillment of the divine will. It is the uncommon gift to bear difficulties even for many, many years. It is firmness in carrying out arduous tasks to their full completion. Perseverance in a lifetime of fidelity to one's vocation in spite of heavy trials or disappointments permitted by God. And it is gladness in being privileged to suffer persecution or humiliation in union with Christ and for the sake of his name and his bride, the church. So where supernatural courage, summed up, is more aggressive and on point of pursuing the good, the true, and the beautiful and defending them, Supernatural fortitude is more patient in doing so, what's sometimes called the virtue of long-suffering. We all need both of these supernatural virtues, not just bishops. Singles, marrieds, consecrated religious, active and contemplative, widows and widowers, regardless of one's state in life. St. Ambrose says in a letter to bishops, I love this, he was the confessor of St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, and in a letter to bishops he says this, quote, you have entered upon the office of bishop, sitting at the helm of the church, you pilot the ship against the waves, take firm hold of the rudder of faith, so that the severe storms of this world cannot disturb you. The sea is mighty and vast, but do not be afraid. For as scripture says, he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. The church of the Lord is built upon the rock of the apostles among so many dangers in the world. It therefore remains unmoved. The church's foundation is unshakable and firm against the assaults of the raging sea. Waves lash out at the church, but do not shatter her. Although the elements of this world constantly beat upon the church with crashing sounds, the church possesses the safest harbor of salvation 
for all those in distress. End quote. You know what allowed St. Ambrose to write such a thing? Faith tells me this. He possessed the peace of Christ. Pure, plain, and simple. He possessed the peace of Christ, which we heard about in our second reading from Ephesians chapter 2. Today. It's because he had the peace of Christ, he could write that while being a bishop himself. And I close with this, St. Ignatius of Antioch, bishop and martyr. He says, just beg for me the courage and fortitude, not only to speak, but also to will what is right, true and good, so that I may not only be called a Christian, but also prove to be one. Amen to that. What a gift we have in the hierarchical structure of Holy Mother Church, the Bride of Christ. And let us always, my friends, with deliberate intent, Pray for the virtues of supernatural courage and supernatural fortitude for our bishops who lead us. God bless you.